programs in the countries she visits each year. In 2018, at the Bhakti Fest in Joshua Tree, California, she was presented with the annual humanitarian award by Deepak Chopra that is for no her 50 plus years of work in devotional art and teachings of Bhakti Yoga. I'm sorry if I mispronounced anything. It was perfect, Rira. Yeah, perfect. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much, Rira. And thank you to Romans for inviting me to read from my memoir this evening. Uh, the memoir is called The Art of Spiritual Life, which is kind of a pun because we have art. Uh, I was the first artist of the Krishna Consciousness Movement in the West, which started in 1965 by my spiritual teacher, Srila Bhaktivedanta Swami Maharaj Prabhupada. And uh, also, so it tells, the book tells how he taught me art, transcendental art, I guess you'd call it, or in his words, windows to the spiritual world, um, f by teaching me the philosophy of bhakti yoga, or yoga meaning link with the supreme consciousness through love and devotion. And I was one of his first disciples, so I guess I could say I'm the senior lady disciples of Srila Prabhupada uh, when he first came to America in 1965 when we were all in the uh, flower children, 60s, um, what do you call that? Uh, picketing against the war in Vietnam and um, very uh, dissatisfied with the consciousness of our parents, our political leaders, and uh, it was the time of Bob Dylan and Joan Baez, and Bob Dylan used to sing, the times they are changing and the answers are blowing in the wind, but where they were, it was just blowing, and nobody had answers for why is everybody suffering, why am I suffering, who am I? I remember just before I met my spiritual master, I asked my mother, Mom, if I weren't born in your womb, would I still exist? Like going a little into reincarnation, and she said, well, I guess so. Anyway, a few days later, uh, I was on my way to, um, to see a boyfriend uh, on, across from Tompkins Square Park. I took five subways, IRT, BMT, to get there. Plus, I was on LSD that day. Plus, I was uh, decided about my father who I considered very mean, physically mean and uh, emotionally mean, that this person can't be my father. There must be some other father. And that turned out to be my spiritual father. So here I am. I'm going to go right into the reading. Um, when the first day that I met him. So, a few days later, I decided to visit my boyfriend who lived in the East Village. Boarding the IRT train, I made the journey downtown once again. On my way, I remembered a recent drug deal turned bad, and my life in bed as I got cheated. I was, I was cheating, and so the cheaters always get cheated. I was selling LSD, which is not the greatest thing to do. And uh, somebody uh, sold me sugar, sugar squares instead of LSD, and I lost all my whole summer uh, earnings. And so I was really a, a mess, emotional mess. And so I was thinking, remembering my recent drug deal gone bad, my life in general, causing me to ask myself, because I don't know if any of you have ever been on hallucinogens, I guess marijuana is a little like that, but LSD, you start thinking that you're God. So then I'm causing me to ask myself, 
if I'm all-knowing, if I'm that it, that impersonal God, then why am I so gullible? So here I am now in the subway, tossed back and forth on the subway seat, and I'm on LSD that day. I stared at my own reflection in the grimy window, trying, as it were, to see my soul in the glass. All I saw was blackness as the train entered a tunnel and shot along the darkened tracks. I silently called out, Who am I really? If I'm the cause of everything, if I'm in some sense God, why can't I control anything? Why can't I just mentally transport myself downtown rather than taking this disgusting train? Emerging from the subway system, I walked to 9th Street, heading towards Tompkins Square Park. It was a large park stretching several blocks. It was the centerpiece of its eclectic neighborhood in the middle of the East Village in New York. It was a famous playground and personal backyard of sorts for hippies and counterculture intellectuals, which I considered myself one of to smoke marijuana, discuss left-wing politics. We were against, we were kind of like going towards communism because fed up with the capitalistic, militaristic governments. And uh, play music, get to know each other in the park. It was a place where I too spent many evenings looking for happiness and not finding any. On this particular occasion, I had no intention of casually socializing with anyone. My depression weighed on me so heavily that I hurried through the park, anxious to reach my boyfriend's house. I heard the guitars twanging. Maybe those who are of my generations, this may all sound familiar to you. Bongo drums beating their African rhythms and transistor radios blasting the sounds of the famous mid-60s rock bands like the Rolling Stones, Simon and Garfunkel, Jefferson Airplane, Bob Dylan, and Joan Baez, among others. I regularly shelter in this conglomerate of sounds, but that day I was only wanting peace of mind. But then, all of a sudden, a very different sound attracted my attention. It was soft and hypnotic, exotic in some sense, and yet hauntingly familiar. Something buried deep inside me responded to it. That old sound is emerging again. I had no idea what that meant, but later on, uh, as I entered into the philosophy I understood, that I had been doing this in a previous life and now picked up at this moment. I had to find the source of the music. It wasn't difficult, for halfway into the park, a loud, large crowd had formed around some central spectacle. Gathering to listen were elderly European men dressed in old-fashioned suits and European women in fancy handkerchiefs, kerchiefs, and heavy sweaters. Throngs of American and Puerto Rican children also joined the crowd, and stray dogs too. Everyone seemed focused on this sound. And where it was coming from. I was inwardly pulled in the direction of the crowd not realizing that what I was about to see and hear would change my life forever. And even now, I was 19 then, 54 years later, it's still changing my life moment by moment. So this next uh, subtitle is called First Sight. I gently pushed through the gathering for a better view, and then I saw him. He was dressed in pale peach-colored robes, playing a bongo drum and chanting that sounded, what sounded like an ancient hymn. He sat cross-legged on an oriental rug under a huge oak tree. 
his eyes were closed and his demeanor was peaceful yet intense. He seemed completely absorbed in his chanting as if experiencing a different reality. He appeared ageless, timeless, and yet right there in our midst. My first impression of him when I saw him sitting on that Indian rug surrounded by his followers playing small cymbals, he was playing the uh, bongo drums, that's a little, kind of like a little Indian one-sided drum, and um, his followers were clapping, heads looking up to the sky, some of them were wearing Indian robes, and some of them regular hippie Western clothing, like the rest of us. So they all danced barefoot, and my first impression of him, like, he looks like a genie coming, flying in on a magic carpet. And I still think of him like that, 40, 54 years later. He's not, um, he's not physically present in the world, but very much present in the world, in the hearts of millions, in the books of millions. And because, as I learned, this uh, philosophy is non-different from the reality. So just by reading a book, you get transported to another world. Anyway, continuing. They all dance barefoot in a small circle on the oriental rug. It was as if the voice called me from deep in my soul, beckoning me in ways that were new and refreshing, and yet as ancient as time itself. I was totally mesmerized. Their leader, the one who had initially caught my eye, looked so mystical that I could only compare him to what I thought of ancient India, that is, the genie on the magic carpet. And what was he chanting? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Krishna, Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama. Rama, Rama, Hare Hare. As the chanting came to an end, but it was like it was a tune though. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. As the chanting came to an end, that central Buddha like figure stood up. He was not tall in terms of height. He was kind of my height, like 5'4". But his poise, his stature, and demeanor executed authority and dignity. And so here's exactly what I saw on that day. He was standing in front of this oak tree. I was probably there on that day. And this is a close-up of him, my spiritual teacher. Huh? Okay, so I have one more minute before uh, we start asking for questions. So just to zip through many years, I received over 90 letters from him uh, where I stayed in the temples that I stayed in. We received many, um, many visits from him. I got to ask him so many questions. He directed me so much to paint first for his temples then for his books, now uh, having distributed over 500 million books in 81 languages. So these are some of the paintings that I did for his books. Very uh, mystical, underwater scenes, as you see here. Demigoddesses, um, Krishna, who uh, Prabhupada taught me is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the cause of all causes, then all that exists. And uh, this is a picture that I did of Hanuman, Lord Ram's monkey, devotee, some pastimes of Krishna as a, a boy, and uh, just many, many paintings. 
Perhaps some of you have heard of Bhagavad Gita. So uh, this is a painting that I did uh, for Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita as it is. Krishna instructing Arjun because Arjun is now in front of a battlefield realizing it's a civil war. It just hit him and now he's lamenting and crying so it's Krishna's teaching you're not that body. This is one of the most famous ones that I did. Uh, it's on millions of altars and um, of Krishna's half man, half lion incarnation who whenever we're in danger we sing this mantra to him and then we feel so much protection. So I think the time is up now for the, for the presentation and if there are any questions, I welcome you to ask them. I have my um, assistants, my team uh, manages my website page, not website, yeah, website, art website called The Art of Spiritual Life. That's for the memoir. And I also have an art website called Bhakti, bhaktiart.net showing 200 of my paintings done by Prabhupada's and my Shiksha Guru Shulan Rai Goswami Maharaj's mercy. I also have Instagram and Facebook that they manage under the name Shamarani. Okay, so if there are any questions, I'll be happy to hear them. All right, um, we are running short on time, so I will pick uh, one question out okay. of the list. Okay. Okay. So what is the most important teaching you received from your spiritual teacher? Thank you, that's a great question. The most important um, teaching that I've received is that we're all part of the same person, Krishna, the reservoir, meaning the reservoir of all pleasure and truth. Just like I have different parts of my body and they're all parts of my body. So they work very harmoniously together unless I have some disease. And they all work to serve the stomach and by doing that, it gives all the parts energy. So uh, the teaching is that we're all brothers and sisters with the same father and um, how to be free from envy and greed and lust by knowing this, that we're just part and parcel of that supreme whole and I'm not this body, this body is just a dress. So no need to put all my attention there like, you know, cleaning the bird cage without feeding the bird inside. Well, thank you for uh, your, thank you to everyone with their wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, just so the audience knows, uh, this was all of our authors' first time doing a virtual reading, virtual author event, and I think they did a fantastic job. So uh, thank you to all of our authors for uh, taking the time. To thank you, us. Ira. Tuned in. Uh, again, if you're considering purchasing any of the featured books uh, tonight, just click on the green purchase button directly below the uh, viewer screen. I also provided the link in the chat, so you can always click on that. And